Good morning, everybody. My name is Arif Kassim. I'm a science coach with Frontier School Division. Welcome to Envirothon Training 2018. Right now, we'll be conducting our second session with Jen Bryson, our wildlife specialist. So, Jen, you can take it away. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for uh, signing in to my live streaming session. Before we begin today, what we're going to do is I'm going to ask you all to sign in to your YouTube account because I have a couple of questions that I want you guys to actually answer and write out the answers and send them in and then we'll get back to it later in the session. So my first question for you guys is how do you tell a canine versus a feline track apart? The next question is going to be what is the proper name for poop? Animal poop. The third question is how do I tell a mink and a pine marten apart when I'm looking at their furs? And the last question is, what is the name for the shearing teeth? The tooth that is the shearing tooth when I'm looking at a skull. So I have a couple of questions here. I want you guys to discuss. I want you guys to send in the answers, see if we can get you guys involved. And we're going to get back um, to these as we move along. Okay? Great. Hopefully you wrote those down. All right, so the first thing that we are going to talk about is going to be furs. So what I'm going to go over today are going to be the hands-on things that you might not be able to access depending on where you are. Um, so furs is excellent to go over. Basically, when we look at a fur or I'm going to give you furs on a test, they're going to be usually the full pelt. And if it's not the full pelt, it'll be the fur will be easily identifiable by its unique features. So just keep that in mind. When you are looking at the furs on a test, please feel free to pick up the fur, touch the fur, pet the fur, look it over, make sure you're checking all angles of the fur to help you identify it. If there's say multiple furs on the table that look very similar, pick them both up, compare them. So don't be shy. One thing you never want to see is when someone's doing a fur uh, question is them just standing back looking at the table because it's not very good. All right. so. We'll start at the very end over here with our largest pelt, which is pretty easy to identify. This is our black bear. Now black bears are not always going to be black. They can be a variety of different colors. They can even have a reddish tinge fur. They can have brown fur. In uh, BC they have the spirit bear, which have actually white fur. It's still a black bear though. Um, brown, so any color. Some of them are really shaggy. Some of them aren't so shaggy. So. There's quite a variety in the black bear pelts, but they're all the black bear. I don't have a sample of polar bear, which I'm very sad about. But polar bear fur is obviously going to be, anybody know the color? It's not white, it's actually clear. And then their skin underneath is actually black. So, but when you look at it from a distance, obviously it looks like big white polar bear. Um, Next one I have here are my foxes. So I have a couple of different species here. The first one I have is called a cross fox. Cross foxes are called this because if you look at their back on the pelt, they have what looks like a cross down the back and across the shoulders. I'll show you another sample of a cross fox. Same idea. You can kind of see it's dark down the spine and then across the arm. So that's how you get the cross fox name. Now a cross fox, fun factoid, is still a red fox, but they have a, they have a different kind of color phase. Um, so it's unique and they're called cross foxes. Another fox that we have is our, I'm just going to like coat myself in first. <laughs> Next one I have is our red fox. So our red fox is obviously red. Excellent job everybody. Pretty easy to identify, they got the big bushy tail. Pretty easy to get this one. So for example, this would be one that I could give you a patch of fur and expect you guys to identify it as a red fox, not having the whole pelt. I have um, the smallest fox we have, which is our Arctic fox. Obviously these are trapped usually in the winter time when we have like the nice thick, thick coats that come in and they have a beautiful white um, coloration to them. So we have an Arctic fox. When it's not the winter time, they can be, gosh, gray, black, all sorts of different kind of different color tones to them. So we have our Arctic fox. 
What else have we got here? Our raccoons. Easily identifiable features on a raccoon. Striped tail. And our masked little guy. That's our little masked man that likes to steal into your garbage. Can be a nuisance species. We also have another easily identifiable fur, which is our skunk. We have striped skunks here. Um, when you do put down your uh, names, I do encourage you to put the full name. So write, make sure you're writing striped skunk, not just skunk. We have, oh, this is one beauty. Now this here is our snowshoe hair, which is actually going through a color transition. So this is beautiful, beautiful pelt. So we have his summer phase going into the winter phase. But this is a snowshoe, snowshoe hair. If you just write rabbit, I'm not going to give you full marks. Because I'm strict like that. Um, OK, wait, I'll go this one first. We also have our little red squirrels, which is easy because it has red on it. And it's little. So you should not be mixing this with any other species like a red fox, because that would just be wrong. So this is a red squirrel. All right. Do we have any answers yet for any of the questions? None? One? What am I looking at? Did they which? For any of the questions there, maybe? None? Oh, I can't ask you my question. Then. I'll have to skip this one. So if you know the difference between a mink and a pine martin, make sure you send that in, because I'm going to ask you about that in a minute. So I'll put those aside. Put all my weasels aside. And I'll need an assistant there, Owen, or whoever. Now we have here two different canines. Sometimes people get these quite mixed up. So one on our, my side over here is a coyote, and the one that Olwyn is holding here is a wolf. So uh, wolves can be either timber wolves or gray wolves, same thing. Cross it over, it's fine. Um, now size difference, how do you tell them apart? One thing I look at is um, a couple different things. The snout tends to be broader on a wolf versus on a coyote. Um, coyotes have a kind of gray, black, brown tone to them, and they tend to all have this same kind of um, coloring. Whereas when you look at a wolf, wolves can be anything from this gorgeous, you know, black, white, cream color. They can be brown, they can be all black, all white. All white. They have quite a wide range of different colors that wolves are. Um, the other thing is when you hold them up and you hold them sideways, this is another thing. So this is why I tell you guys always pick up the furs because this is how you can compare. If you look at the legs, coyotes have like little stumpy legs in comparison to the long legs of a wolf. They don't have actual stumpy legs, but compared to the wolf, they're shorter. Also, also, what am I comparing here? Lengths. I guess we do the camera. <laughs> so they are also shorter in uh, total length as compared to a wolf. Okay, so there's your coyote and your wolf. Thank you, Ms. I have another one for you, actually. Okay. Mm -hmm. Now to our felines. Owen is holding up our beautiful lynx, and then I have a bobcat. The one I don't have actually a sample of is a cougar which I really would love to have, but I don't have one. So we have a lynx and we have a bobcat. So differences, you're going to look at this size. Obviously, there is quite a size difference between the two. Lynx are larger. Um, there is a lot of spotting generally on a bobcat. Um, one thing I should actually point out, though, is some bobcats are actually quite, quite large, depending on where you are. If you go even further north, they're huge. <laughs> so uh, a couple of things to look at. Ears, when you look at their ear tufts, I don't know if we can zoom into the ear tufts. One of them flips up really good. Oh no, his ear tuft fell off. Oh dear. Oh, there it's it is. Folded. We're there good. Okay. If you look at their ear tufts, <laughs> see the difference? A bobcat has short little ear tufts. So this is the bobcat here. And then the lynx has a longer ear tuft. So that's a difference between the two. And another thing on their face, this is why I tell you, pick it up, move it around is they actually have like, I call it the goatee, a little sideburn going on here. Um, on the bobcat, it's shorter. And if you look at the lynx, they actually usually have pretty nice long ones. If you can, there you go. So he's got the nice long goatee on the side, sideburns, and then the bobcat has shorter ones. So there's a couple little ones. And the last one, which is the most identifiable feature, which 
is a bobcat, when you look at the very tip of their tail, they will always, always have a half black, half white tip on their tail. And unfortunately, the very tip of this tail fell off, <laughs> but it would be completely black. I should just dye it. Yeah. <laughs> so bobcat, think half white, half black, and a lynx, totally black tip on the tail. So there you go, a couple differences between these two pelts, and they're so soft. So soft. So soft. Thank you. Um, here's another one, we'll do one more. One more. Nice to compare. So these are a couple different aquatic species that are in and out of the water. So the one on my right here is your beaver. And now beaver have usually the nice, beautiful reddish brown tinge. They have their long guard hairs and the beautiful soft pelt underneath. They're usually always cut out in a nice circular pattern, but if you were to get a sample, just make sure that you're looking for those nice long guard hairs and look for that extremely soft under fur, okay? Now this is not a baby beaver, which I have had as an answer before in a test. No, this is a muskrat. So a muskrat, this is like a fully grown muskrat, also generally comes in a nice circular pattern. Very, very soft, but you don't have those extremely long guard hairs like you see in a beaver. Also, major size difference. <laughs> So, any other things you can think of for these two? And so, one of the things that you'll see in a lot of aquatic species, we don't have otters in Manitoba. Or, we yeah, have we do have, we have otters. River otters. We have river otters, but we don't really see their uh, pelts as often. They're not as common. Um, but something you'll see in every aquatic species is how dense this fur is. So this de this fur is not only oily, but it's extremely dense, and that helps them keep nice and toasty, warm while they're in their aquatic environment. Mm -hmm. Really great adaptation of theirs. So that's why when we talk about um, a couple different aquatic species, so I have the uh, river otter right there here. We go. Yeah, so the river otter actually has the dense, the densest, is that a word? Densest? Most dense. Most dense, mm -hmm. most dense fur of all of the uh, species. Um, so they have more hairs per square inch than any other one. So it's very, very thick and you can actually feel the oils on the pelt when you actually touch it, which is another reason why I encourage you to touch them so you can actually feel the oily residue on it. So obviously pretty easy to identify as well with a long tail, long tubular body. And then yours, you wanna talk about this one? So this is actually a unique fur in the fact that this is actually from a young animal. So this is from a young seal, a ring seal, which we have in Manitoba and we talk a lot about, not only because there is a lot of controversy around their harvest, but they're re really important um, prey species for our polar bears. So this is actually a very new um, addition to our collection, <laughs> obviously because these are really expensive and really important, but we want to show there's a lot of differences you can feel when you feel this for most seals. You kind of look at them and they look really sleek. This one has a little bit more of a feel to it, but it has a very distinctive pattern. You see the roundness of this individual as well. A little bit short and the fur has a completely different short feel to it so it looks completely different but when you're looking at something like this you're gonna look at its overall shape but very importantly as a very unique pattern that goes along its back mm -hmm. that really identifies it with the gray that this is a young ring seal awesome all right and um, we'll go into my weasels so we've got we've got here a um, which I love, it's my favorite one here for uh, beautiful pelts. So we have a wolverine. Wolverines are easy to identify because they will always have this nice light brown ring around the back and along the sides. And they've got a big long bushy tail. These are extremely aggressive species. Um, very, very, very strong. They also always have the white on their jaw area here. Uh, their fur, cool fact about this one here is they actually the fur will not frost. So up north they use this quite often as um, the edging on hoods because you can breathe on it in the winter time, it's not gonna crystallize, and it's just beautiful. So this here is a wolverine. Our badger. Badgers can be very, uh, you know, can have smaller badgers, little smaller, bigger badgers, um, but they're easily identified by their face marking. So they have the white stripe down the forehead followed by the two darker stripes so pretty easy to identify based on that um, unique uh, striping there 
And again, these guys here actually can have a uh, couple different colors. They can be darker badgers. You can have a little bit of a lighter color badger. So there's a little bit of a range there. Now, oh, I need you again, Olwyn. We're going to talk about some more weasels and how to tell them apart. Did anybody answer any questions? No. God, they're leaving me hanging. All right. So we've got... I'll do... Oh, yeah, I guess because you can't talk. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, we're good. So, for our different um, weasels in the weasel family, you can tell they're weasels because they have long tubular bodies. Um, and to compare them all, we've got, as you can tell just looking at it at a glance, a lot of them look very, very similar, obviously, except for our ermine over here. So let's just talk about that one first. He's white. In the winter time, he turns white, but he'll always have the black tip on his tail. And they do that actually as a defense mechanism. So when a predator is hunting them in the snow, um, they actually use their tail as like a little flag and it distracts the predator and the predator is going to go and try and attack the tip of the tail because it stands out against the snow. And then the ermine usually can get away because it's really hard to grab that just little piece of black there. So cool little thing, factoid about ermines, also known as short-tailed weasels. Either or is acceptable on a test. Now, our three um, species here, notice I say three species, it's not four species. We have our larger ones over here. These ones are always going to be this beautiful chocolate brown color. They always have really, really bushy tails. Um, this one here is a male, and this one is a female of the same species. So this here is a fisher. Um, they you know, travel around in trees. They are um, also an aggressive species as well. <laughs> but they always have this beautiful chocolate brown coat. Um, just look for the really chocolate brown coat and the very bushy tail. Now, of these two, um, we have a mink and a pine marten. So how do I tell these two apart? This was one of the questions I was wanting to get you guys to give me some feedback on. Let's notice how much Jen loves this question. <laughs> I love it. So. It's actually really easy to tell them apart. So a pine marten is always going to have an orange cream color on the chest, as you can see here. Whereas a mink, sometimes they'll have some white markings on their belly, but the thing that they always, always have is a white chin. So as you can see, he has a white chin. Notice that the pine marten does not. So minks will always have that little white chin. Um, that is the giveaway. If it doesn't have a white chin, you're probably looking at a marten, okay? So creamy orange chest, marten, white chin, mink, okay? That's how you tell the two apart. I was going to say, Jen, one of my favorite old-time facts uh -huh. about our wolverine. Uh -huh. the scientific name is called gulo gulo, which means glutton glutton, because that perfectly describes that animal. If you look at a wolverine, especially up north, they are gluttonous. They like to sit on a kill for days and days and days, even if it puts them in danger. And they'll eat and eat and to eat until they cannot eat anymore. So it's my spirit animal? Pretty much. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Okay, so we'll move on to our tracks and our scats. So um, the scientific word for poop animal poop is scat and that's what we like to use for those of us that are going out and doing um, identifications um, and studies. So uh, some tracks that I would expect you to be able to know off the top of your head are going to be, uh, obviously I want you to know all of the ungulates. So those of you that don't know what ungulate means, those are all your hooved animals. So I have a couple here, there's going to be five different um, ungulates that I want you to identify. So I'm gonna try and set them up here so that you can see them all. All right. Can we see them? Does that work? Excellent, okay. So of the five, we have our, this is a juvenile moose, so it's actually quite small. Um, moose though, think of it like giant deer track. That is what they look like. Um, when we're looking at a deer track, just think of this nice simple one. You know, this is pretty common. Most people know this track. Looks like a little upside down heart. So if you put it this way, it loves you. So we have our deer track, our bison, even though they don't roam wild anymore, um, except for in our national park. Um, they do our species that used to be here. So I would like to know the track. So when I look at bison tracks, one thing is that kind of reminds me of like a cow track. So they've got very round hooves. When you look at it all together, it's got a very circular shape to it and quite broad. 
are elk. When I look at elk tracks, I always look at it and think of uh, orange slices. So it looks like a half a nice big segment of orange and another segment of orange. They've got quite a little edge to the uh, side of the track, so it's quite prominent when you see this. And then the last one that we have is a caribou track. Now, caribou have their hind toes here, will always stick out generally in a track, so it's quite noticeable. And they actually have these nice curved hooves because they use it to scoop through the snow and to actually get to the grasses down below. So it's like a little scoop. Um, so some cool information there for you. And these are the main uh, ungulates that I expect you to be able to identify just by sight alone. Um, what do we have next here? Now, uh, for our canines, let's just right off the hop, we should talk about how do I tell the difference between a feline versus a canine track? So the one thing that you want to look for is going to be the presence of claws or not. Good. So if you can see the claws, Generally, that means that you're gonna have a canine because felines have retractable claws, just like your house cat. And so when they're walking, they don't generally show on their tracks. Of course, that's not going to be every time. Maybe they're jumping or maybe they're you know, grabbing onto something and so the track will indicate part of the claw. But generally speaking, if they have claws, you're looking at a wolf. The other thing that you're gonna look for is the base of the pad. And on a feline, they always have three little ridges, whereas the canine will have two. So that's another really easy little hint that'll help you out. So can you see it better there? There you go. So we have one, two, three, and one, two. Presence of claws, no claws. Okay, so that's generally how you tell the difference. So to look at these here, um, this track is about the size of my hand. So this indicates to me that we have a wolf track right here. This one is quite large as well. And this indicates to me that this is a cougar track, okay? Now to continue with some canine tracks, so that you can see them in comparison, I have my wolf track. The next track down in size is going to be a coyote track. When you're looking at coyote tracks, one thing to keep in mind is the overall shape is going to be an oval. So they always have that nice oval shape. And they also have the side toes are tucked underneath the front toes. So if you notice, these two are actually underneath the front two middle toes and kind of sitting underneath them nice tucked in close together and the front two toes are always parallel so they're facing the same direction forwards so that's how you tell a coyote track and this one here is a fox track and it is smaller um, and the one giveaway for a fox track is always going to be this high ridge that you see in the pad at the base of the pad so on this one here this is kind of like a little crescent shape that's going to be on the base as you can see when you actually look at this mold it does stick out quite hard and you can see it sometimes as a line in the mud but you will always see that nice little crescent at the base of the pad which will indicate that you have a fox okay <clears throat> so just to show you our feline tracks so we have our cougar tracks here and then the smaller one that i have right here is a bobcat track and this one actually has a slight indication of some uh, claws. So I think this actually probably was taken in mud. You can see very clearly all of the fur in the pads. And we have a bobcat track. So these are the two that I have for felines. Couple other ones that I would expect you to be able to identify just on site alone. like I'm serving a dish of tracks. So a couple here that I would expect you to be able to identify. When it looks like a person's hand, I call them little people hands, those are your raccoons. That's why it's really easy for them to get into your, uh, your garbage. They can open up any of your Tupperware containers that when you go camping. They're quite dexterous with their fingers. So this here is a raccoon track. Kind of similar. It's got long fingers and really long uh, nice long claws. This is actually the front track of a beaver. The back track would be webbed. Uh, they actually have non-webbed front tracks because it's for them to pick up sticks and to move mud around. And the back feet are webbed to help them move fast through the water. 
Porcupine are unique. They have quite often like these little, you'll see little spots. They look a little dots, as you can see here. It's a unique pattern on the pad of their um, paws. And they also have four little digits. So they have four digits, not five like you see on the raccoon. Um, your um, badgers are going to have your very, very, very long claws used for digging. And then this one here is going to be your common rabbit. We have your back track and your front track. So these are some other ones that I would expect you to be able to identify on site. And last but not least, two more. We have our bear track. Um, I would expect you to be able to identify the large bear track. And then this one here is actually a river otter. So river otters are different than beavers in that their front feet are webbed and their back feet are as well. So both of them are webbed. Okay, on to scat, because that is my favorite thing in the world to talk about, is scat. And I like to call myself a scatologist. It's my invented word. Um, so first things first, when we're looking at scat, I'm going to warn you that I compare scat to food, because it helps me to remember. So that's one very easy way to remember your scat is to think, hey, what food product does this remind me of? Well, let me tell you, because there's a lot. There's actually, all of this is on the uh, resource page, and um, you'll see on there how I have it compared to different foods. So when we talk about pellets, um, that's one type of scat that we look at. Um, pellets are usually from herbivores, obviously, because they're eating uh, plant and woody vegetation, and that's what their scat comes out as, is in pellet form. So we have our common um, cottontail rabbit scat, and these ones are going to be um, looking like your chocolate M&Ms, okay? Um, when we have your uh, squirrels, and their scat comes out looking like Tic Tacs. Um, our white-tailed deer, which I actually think I left on the other counter over there. Um, but these are a little bit bigger, they look like chocolate-covered raisins. And then one size up from white-tailed deer is going to be your elk. And elk is going to look like probably a chocolate-covered peanut. And then <laughs> moving up, we're going to look at moose, which you're looking at like a chocolate-covered almond, okay? Don't eat them. They're not chocolate-covered almonds. <laughs> now, when we're looking at this pellet formation, this actually looks like, when you see it in uh, real life, is compressed sawdust into a ball. So when you look at it, it looks like compressed sawdust. To me, it's, oh, it's eating something very woody. That is beaver. And beaver track, uh, beaver scat, sorry, is usually left um, near the water's edge. It's usually in the water or in their latrines. Um, but this is the formation, large compressed sawdust. Okay, beaver. And one of my favorites is porcupine. So when porcupine, um, they usually hang out in a tree for quite a time, go down, go up onto another tree, hang out for a while. And they usually end up with these large piles of scat at the base of the tree. And they kind of look like macaroni. And if you're really lucky, a lot of them look like macaroni necklaces. So they kind of like poop in a little necklace shape. I don't recommend wearing them, but that is macaroni poop necklaces, porcupine. Let's see some other ones here for you guys. And I'll leave those ones. Okay, so um, obviously if you don't know this one, it's called a bear scat. It's the largest one. They lick, they're tubular. They usually drop them in plops, kind of in a row. So that's your black bear scat. Uh, skunk scat, I always find hilarious because I swear every single skunk scat looks like this in the wild. It's like two poops laid side by side. Um, they're tapered on the end, little tiny tubes. This, they all look alike, I swear. Um, raccoon scat, highly, highly variable, similar in that black bear is variable as well. These are both omnivores, so they eat a variety of different um, food. So if it's a you know, heavy berry season, they're just gonna look like giant piles of berries. If there's a heavy insect season, say when the June bugs are out, all you'll see is a big plop of June bug shells. Um, so they do change quite a bit. Um, raccoon scat, this is an extremely small sample of a raccoon. In the wild, you can see them almost as big as a bear scat, I swear. They're huge. Um, and these are actually different birds. So when we have bird scat, our smaller scatter is going to be like grouse. So these kind of look like little mini Cheetos. And then our bigger ones, they always look like J's and S's. 
and our J's and our S's, when they curl up like this, we know that this is a turkey scat. All right, now the last scats that I want to show you Now these are belonging to our canines and our felines. So these are going to be tubular and the way you can tell canine versus feline apart is that felines have segments in them. So right here if by segments I mean like they have little segments of scat, so a little poop segmented together. So we have this one right here, this sample is a bobcat so it's smaller than this sample right here which you can see has segments as well. This is a juvenile um, cougar so it's actually quite small compared to like a standard cougar scat, but they all have like long tubes, but they're segmented. Okay, think of like a Rolo. That one just came to my head. <laughs> now, our uh, canines, they have long tubular scats. So this is also an extremely small sample of a wolf scat, um, but this is wolf scat right here. When you're going down in size, you're looking at probably about the size of like a hot dog, like a jumbo hot dog. Um, those are gonna be your coyotes and then you have your foxes. Now, one thing to keep in mind is, let me pull out my favorite thing in the world, best purchase I ever made, which is my scat bandana. On here, it actually has a beautiful examples of the different scats, so you can see how uh, mountain lion, so cougar, has a nice segmented scat. Coyote has long tubular scat. You're going to find things like hair, bone, all twisted in there. Um, you have your bobcat, again, segmented. Fox is smaller. And then you have a nice, huge, think of like a jumbo sausage size wolf scat. Okay? All right. And um, how much time do I got? Oh, I have a question. <gasps> So we do have a couple of questions coming from Dave Hall. Okay. So both questions are, are you expecting us to tell the difference between mule and white-tailed deer, or will it just be deer? It would just be white-tailed deer for now. Um, it's actually very good that you are aware that, yes, we generally had mule deer here in Manitoba, and that white-tailed deer are actually an invasive species. So very good question. But when I do test you, it would just be uh, white-tailed deer. And his second question is, are there grizzly bear in Manitoba? You, want, you just lit up. She wants to come talk about this. <laughs> I could answer, but you look really excited. <laughs> it's a really good question, and it's definitely one that we've been seeing more and more in the media um, talk about. Now, grizzly bears are really interesting because grizzly bears used to be present in Manitoba. They were an animal that um, became what we call extant. So they were out of this region. They were extinct as far as we were concerned in Manitoba. And for many, many years, especially up north, we've been hearing rumors and comments and conversations about grizzly bears. Are they that? Are they not? It's hard to define. And as wildlife biologists, usually our definition of a species coming back is when a species starts to breed in a province. But then we have one more complicated factor. We also have polar bears. The really cool thing about polar bears and grizzly bears is they are actually um, came from the same animal as recently as about 100,000 years ago. And there's a lot of suggestion and genetics that indicate they can actually interbreed. So what we have been seeing happening is grizzlies are coming into the area and getting involved with polar bears and possibly crossbreeding. Now the science on this is really early and we're really starting to understand this and it's important because what we sometimes think is a combination or a hybrid between these two species can just be a really unique individual from one or the other for other reasons. But there is suggestion that they're coming in here and with climate change may encounter each other more and possibly start to interbreed again, which is a really cool question and something we're really excited about. Tell them the names. Uh, yeah, so tell the names. I'm really bad at both names. Oh, okay. so Jacqueline can say all the names. I know them, but I'm really bad at the names. <laughs> this is and obviously, effort. you can see we're really all excited. <laughs> about we're very this. excited about this. Okay, so um, polar bear grizzly. Um, the rule of thumb is you go by the male um, in a breeding pair. So if the male is grizzly, a polar bear grizzly hybrid is called the growler and if the male is the polar bear then it's called a pizzly. Um, what they're finding that's neat is that the second generation of these offspring are actually able to reproduce as well so it is becoming a distinct species. Yeah. Um, up in Churchill the Parks Canada um, they do 
um, promote that they have three bears of Wapusk, which is right beside Churchill region, um, and the three bears are uh, black bear, polar bear, and grizzly bear in Churchill region. Absolutely. All right, so we're going to try and scooch through this quickly because I only have 10 minutes left. So we're going to go, um, we're going to touch upon dental formula. Dental formula is when you look at a skull and you're going to try and identify the skull based on its teeth and the formation of the teeth and the number of teeth in the skull. Um, using that uh, dental formula and a skull plate, you can actually determine what species you have. So right here I have a skull. I've found it. Um, first thing you want to do is identify the various teeth that you can see on the skull. So this goes like so. On the very front you have your incisors. You have the next tooth is the canines, which are the sharp piercing teeth your premolars, and then your molars. Now, when I'm testing you on uh, dental formula, generally I'm gonna test you on a species that's either a carnivore or an omnivore, so that way you can clearly differentiate between a premolar and a molar. And um, that's because you can actually see the shearing tooth, which was one of those questions I asked earlier, and the shearing tooth is called the carnassial tooth. So that tooth, how you determine what it is, is you put your uh, upper and lower skull jaw together, and you chomp, 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 you look for that tooth that's the largest molar and it's used to actually shear meat, so like scissors. So to me, I know that this here and this here are my carnassial teeth. So when I put together my formula, what I'm going to do is I want to draw it like so. First thing I want to have is I for incisors, C for canines, P for premolars, M for molars. When I'm looking at my jaw, the one thing to keep in mind is we're only ever going to count one half of the jaw. So one half of the upper jaw, one half of the lower jaw. So we're going to put the uh, half of the upper jaw teeth here and the lower jaw here, okay? So on the top I have one, two, three in the upper incisors. On the bottom I also have three incisors. One canine in the upper and the lower. And here's the fun part. So for premolars, to determine what your premolars are, you need to indicate which one is your carnassial tooth. Because on your upper skull, the upper jaw, the carnassial tooth counts as a premolar. But just to mess with you, on the lower jaw, it counts as a molar. So I always think lower molar, lower molar, lower molar. And that's how I get stuck in my head so I don't screw it up. So counting it as my upper jaw, one, two, three, four, because I'm counting that as a premolar. And on the bottom, one, two, three, four, and I'm not gonna count that one. My molars, so this one is a premolar. I'm gonna look closely. I have one, two. And on this one, because I'm counting the carnassial as a molar, I have one, two, and there's a very tiny tooth. It's still a tooth, so that's three. So this is the beginning of my dental formula. This is the formation of their, the arrangement of their teeth. Next step that you're going to do is you're going to add up your teeth. So I like to add up the top row. So 3 plus 4 plus 1 plus 2, that's going to give me 10. My bottom row, 3 plus 1 plus 4 plus 3, that gives me 11. So that's all the upper and lower on the one side. Put this all together, so I'm going to add it together. 10 and 11 is 21. Now remember, this is just half of the jaw, so I need to multiply that by 2. So my total number of teeth is going to be 42, okay? So when I see you guys write this on a test, I do want to see the clear indication of the formula that you have right and the total number of teeth, okay? That's the most important part because that's where you get your points. The next thing I do is I generally will have on the table what's called uh, a dental formula sheet and it will have the total number of teeth listed on the side and then the common names and the Latin names of those species that have that number of teeth next to it. So I'm going to look for 42 and over here I have everything from arctic fox, coyote, gray wolf, red wolf, polar bear, gray fox, black, grizzly, brown bear, uh, red swift, and a kit fox. <clears throat> so um, obviously the skull to me, we can use our deductive reasoning and say, hey guys, do we have any foxes that are this large? I'm going to say no. So I can pretty much wipe out all of the foxes right now. The next thing is, does it look like a very, very large polar bear skull? Doesn't look like it to me. But if you're not sure, the one thing that you can do is go, hmm, I'm gonna go look at the skull plate that's provided to me on the table. So skull plates here, 
Um, you basically look at your skull. You're going to measure it using a ruler. Lay a, lay a ruler down, look over directly top, measure it out. This is about 11 inches. So I'm gonna go to my canids and bears. Look for a measurement that ties in around 11 inches. Oh look, I have a gray wolf. So using all of the steps, I can now identify the skull as a gray wolf, okay? Easy peasy lemon squeezy. All right, now very quickly, I'm gonna try and fit in population monitoring, which I left my stuff over here. On my bag, perfect. So population monitoring, there's two different uh, tests that we like to do. The first one that we'll go over is, um, we'll do marker capture. So the marker capture method is called the Peterson method that we like to go with. And it has a very simple formula that I would expect you to know off the top of your head. And that formula is N equals MC over R. The one thing to keep in mind is what does MC and R represent? M, that pen doesn't work. M is going to be your marked species. C are your captured species. And R are your recaptured. Make sure you memorize this formula right here, okay? So on a study, what will happen is the, the biologist will go out in the field and they're gonna capture um, some, we'll say all back pocket mice is what we're going for. So the first day they go out in the field, they captured, here's my trap, my awesome hula hoop trap. I've captured four mice, okay? As a scientist, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna mark these. So I'm gonna pretend I've marked them by uh, dyeing them yellow. Usually you just use like a little white out on the top of their head, something like that, and release them back into the wild, something that's easily gonna be there. So I've marked four mice, released them back into the field. Now I know what M is. M is always going to be now four, okay? This number does not change because there's only four mics, mics marked species. The next day I'm gonna go out, reset my traps that night. I've set them, go back. I'm gonna see what I can find in my trap the next day. So we'll pretend I go out, come back the next day. I've caught three mice. So I'm gonna to put together my formula. M is going to be four, because I have my four marked mice. My total captured mice in my trap right here, I have three. So C is represented as three. And how many did I recapture? I have one mouse that I've recaptured. So one. And I know that this is probably really easy, but I don't like doing it. Four times three is 12, right? Divided by one is still 12, right? Yes! I mathed! So our estimated population for the first sample is 12, okay? I'm not gonna do it just once. You're gonna have to do it a couple of times. I'll go back, release these in the wild, go back, test it the next day. We'll pretend this is what I caught on the second night. Same thing, I need to do um, the next survey night. So this formula is going to be, total number is one, two, three, four, five, six. So I have four marked from the original. I have six that I have captured. And how many do I have that are recaptured? I have two. So six times four is what, 24? Divided by two is 12. I mathed. Okay, one more time. Uh, okay, go back for another survey night. What do I have? Same number as M is always the same, four. The uh, number total that I've captured is five. Dividing it by the number that I've recaptured is three, which is gonna give me not a full number. What is that? 20 divided by three. So 20 divided by three is 6.66, see 6.7. And all you have to do is now find the average number altogether. You have to have at least three sample plots to make this work, or three uh, site surveys being done. 
and seven. And I'm gonna divide that by three. So the average of these is 10.2. And because we can't have 0.2 of an animal, we're gonna say the estimated population in this survey is going to be 10 species, okay? So that's our Peterson method, which is important. Well, we'd like to say thank you, Jen Bryson, for that wonderfully interactive training session on wildlife. So thank you, Jen. Thank you. Uh, and we'll continue again in about 15 minutes speaking with Olwyn Friesen regarding our topic on climate change. So bear with us. We'll see you again soon.